Sometime shortly after the death of Jesus, a mysterious man was sitting at a table writing by candlelight. He claimed that he was Jesus' twin brother. In the Coptic Egyptian language, he wrote a compilation of his twin brother's most important parables and teachings. But these teachings would soon be condemned by the church as heretical. The document would disappear from history until a local farmer, a boy, unearthed a jar of scrolls outside Luxor in 1945. Now, these documents revealed an early Christianity much different than what we know today. This is the story of the origins of Christianity and how an obscure cult rose to become the official religion of the most powerful empire in the world and how it then tore that empire apart. About 2,000 years ago, in a far-flung province in the Middle East, a man emerged from the desert with a message, one that would radically alter the course of world events and come to define the lives of billions. Gospel Mysteries The mysterious man claiming to be Jesus' twin brother was writing the Gospel of Thomas. Now, we don't know who he was or if he was actually Thomas, one of Jesus' apostles, or if he was actually Jesus' twin brother, which there's no evidence of. Hey, maybe it was just a guy with a beard, long hair, six-pack abs, and he liked to fish. So people were just like, ah, yeah, that's close enough. It's called the Gospel of Thomas because the word claims to record the secret teachings of Jesus as they were written down by his apostle Thomas, who, curiously enough, was known as the Twin. Now, whether Thomas the Apostle actually authored it remains highly debated by scholars. But the text was highly controversial. It didn't claim Jesus was a Messiah, just simply that he was a good philosopher. In it, Jesus also says there is no earthly kingdom of God, that it can only be found within ourselves, something that the later church, top brass, would call heresy. So it was buried and all references to it were destroyed until 1945 when that local farmer boy unearthed a clay jar full of scrolls in Nag Hammadi, a town some 50 miles outside of Luxor. The scrolls were shocking. In addition to the Gospel of Thomas, there was the Gospel of Philip. In this one, there's a line where Jesus kisses Mary Magdalene and then nothing. There's a hole in the text after that exciting cliffhanger and we're left wondering what kind of relationship did Jesus and Mary really have? Dan Brown made millions off this cliffhanger when he wrote the Da Vinci Code. Now there's also the Gospel of Truth. It's thought that this one was written by a guy named Valentinus in Alexandria around 150 CE. It's considered the most poetic of the texts in the Nag Hammadi Library. In it, abstract concepts like error, hope, and fear are portrayed as living beings, Jesus as the hope. It also says that ignorance caused things like eons or divine emanations to mistakenly create the flawed material world we live in. The physical universe is a negative alien realm that needs to be escaped, something completely contrary to the orthodox Christian belief that God created the material world as inherently good. Gnostic Weirdos Now these lost heretical gospels come from the Gnostic tradition, an early type of Christianity that later heads of a rapidly organizing Christian church deemed not Christian enough and downright evil in a lot of ways. Gnosticism is basically the belief that all people have a little piece of God inside them, a divine spark, if you will. Gnosticism held a fundamentally different view of the world and the human body compared to Orthodox Christianity. In many Gnostic systems, the material world is created by a lower deity called the Demiurge. No, that's the Demogorgon from Stranger Things, though not too far off probably. The Gnostic Demiurge created a world that's intrinsically flawed and evil kind of like how Tim Hortons created the intrinsically flawed and evil buffalo sauce latte. As a result, the human body, as part of this material world, is also seen as a prison for the divine spark within each person. Salvation involves awakening this divine spark and escaping the material realm, kind of like how your bowels will escape if you drink a Tim Hortons buffalo sauce latte. This awakening was achieved through secret teachings and hidden knowledge that was only revealed to people who practice ascetic things like chastity and not having many possessions. The origins of Gnosticism are a little murky. The first couple hundred years in the history of Christianity were full of all kinds of different belief systems. Some forms of Christianity back then were as different as Scientology and Catholicism are now. Judaic and pagan traditions were still getting thrown into the mix. There was a lot going on, but many scholars agreed that the founder of Gnosticism may have been a guy named Simon Magus. Simon Magus was also known as the Magician or Simon the Sorcerer. He lived some time in the first century AD. His life was documented mainly in the New Testament Acts of the Apostles, but he also pops up in texts that didn't make it into the Bible, like the Acts of Peter. I bet Peter was ticked off that he didn't make the cut into the Bible. That could have been life-changing. Simon was a towering figure from Samaria in modern-day Palestine, and he had significant beef with the Apostles Peter and John, who didn't like his Gnostic beliefs and sorcery. 
In Acts, Simon Magus was baptized after hearing Philip the Evangelist preaching. He then followed Philip around, amazed by the miracles he was performing. Then he offered money to Peter and John, hoping to buy the power to impart the Holy Spirit to others through something called the laying on of hands, which wasn't as creepy or confrontational as the phrase implies. Legend has it that Simon could levitate, and one day he tried to prove that he was divine by flying all the way to Rome, meeting up with Icarus along the way, and popping the door off a of Boeing 737. Okay, and maybe not the Boeing 737 part, but Peter, not wanting that to happen, started praying and Simon fell to the ground, dying on impact. Persecution Simon Magus eventually became a symbol of heresy for the early church fathers, but first, they had to basically create the concept of heresy. Up to this point, religion in the region was very fluid. You had rulers adopting all different belief systems and synthesizing them as was most convenient. There were no such things as heresy or orthodoxy in the way we know them now, so these early Christians invented them in order to organize the early church and lay down its foundations. Some of the most influential early guys who made this happen were Irenaeus, a bishop in Lyon in modern-day France. There was also Tertullian, a Christian scholar in Carthage, and Hippopotamus, who lived in Rome. Sorry, Hippolytus. All three lived around the mid to late first century, and all three started professing what was and wasn't truly Christian, what was heretical, and what was orthodox. It helped the early church establish a centralized authority and grow into a behemoth, and it was largely the Gnostics in the crosshairs. The mainstream Christian church asserted that the true teachings of Jesus were those handed down from the apostles to the bishops who succeeded them, maintaining a continuity of doctrine and practice within the church community. Church fathers like the aforementioned Irenaeus and Tertullian argued that this apostolic succession guaranteed the authenticity of Christian teaching against what they saw as the distortions of Gnosticism. They emphasized the importance of the visible institutional church as the guardian of truth and that the secretive individualistic path of the Gnostics wasn't the way to go. After all, how can you get a bunch of people to join your religion if you can achieve salvation all on your own? Although some people may argue that in the Bible it is said people must come together in the house of worship to give praise to the Lord, to stand together in unity, so that if one is struggling, the rest can lift that person up. One of the first big Christian schisms was over the Gnostic doctrine of Docetism. Let's try to unpack this one. Docetism, from the Greek dokio or to seem, says that Jesus only appeared to have a physical body and to suffer on the cross. They theorized that Christ's divine nature was so complete that it couldn't be combined with a real human in the way traditional Christianity teaches. Instead, Jesus' physical appearance on earth was like a phantom or illusion. He seemed to be human but wasn't truly embodied. It's like God was basically just renting out his body, and Christ never really existed in human form. This belief pretty much denied the incarnation, crucifixion, and bodily resurrection of Jesus, central tenets of mainstream Christianity. So, heresy. Historians believe portraying Christ as a human who went through all this suffering on the cross made his story more relatable for people. And relatability is pretty important if you want to spread an idea or a faith. Like, hey, here's Jesus, he's just like you. And he was nailed up on a cross and left to rot, just like you could be if you don't do what we say. Paul's Quest One of the most important figures in the early history of Christianity was Paul. Are we doing this again? No, not that Paul. Paul the Apostle. Paul wasn't one of Jesus' original 12 apostles. He was born in Tarsus in present-day Turkey right around the time the whole crucifixion thing was happening over in Israel. At first, Paul was a Pharisee, a Jewish sect known for its strict adherence to the Law of Moses and Jewish traditions. As early Christianity started taking root, Paul, then known as Saul, was actually actively persecuting Christians. He gave the go-ahead for the stoning of Stephen, one of the first deacons of the Christian church, and the guy who would become the first Christian martyr, I guess if you don't include Jesus as a martyr. In the book of Acts, Saul roams around ravaging Christians, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women and throwing them in jail. But then, of course, a miracle happened. As Saul was traveling to Damascus to persecute some more Christians, he was struck blind by a bright light and heard the voice of Jesus asking, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? After the experience, Saul converted to Christianity. He changed his name from Saul to Paul and redirected his zeal towards spreading the message of Christ. I mean, he hit the road, roads that snaked all over the place, Roman roads. One of the reasons Paul was able to spread the Christian message far and wide was because of Roman infrastructure. This massive scale and growing populace necessitated advancements in Roman engineering. A 50,000 mile long road system was built as well. While made originally for the military, it facilitated the movement of people and ideas throughout the empire. 
Paul built churches and missions all over the place. He preached of a coming apocalypse, of the return of Christ and the end of the current age and the beginning of a new divine kingdom. His travels brought him to Antioch, where he met Peter, one of Jesus' original 12 apostles. In Antioch, Peter and Paul duked it out over whether new Christians had to observe Jewish customs and whether new followers could be Gentiles at all even, or had to be Jewish. According to Paul's account in his letter to the Galatians, Peter had initially been eating meals with the Gentile converts in Antioch, not caring too much about Jewish dietary restrictions. But when a group arrived from the authority of James in Jerusalem, Peter then began separating himself from the Gentile believers during meals because of this pressure to maintain traditional Jewish customs. Like if a guy claiming to be a vegan started eating a hamburger with some non-vegan friends at a restaurant, and then when his vegan girlfriend comes in, he stuffs the hamburger in his pocket and goes and sits at some other table of people eating salads. Paul was like, hey, man, come on, pick a lane, hamburger or girlfriend, it can't be both. He saw this reversal by Peter as outright hypocrisy that contradicted the agreement they'd made in Jerusalem, that Gentiles didn't need to fully convert to Judaism to be part of the Christ-following community. Paul publicly confronted Peter in an early Christian standoff, accusing him of cowardly behavior by forcing Gentiles to live like Jews. Paul ended up winning out, and his insistence that Gentiles could become followers without accepting or following certain Judaic laws helped spread Christianity even further throughout the Roman Empire. But there was a Roman emperor named Nero who didn't like how Christianity was spreading throughout his empire. The Great Fire of 64 AD, when much of the city of Rome burned, gave him an opportunity to blame the Christians. Christian heads rolled through the burnt Roman streets, and Paul's was one of them. Revolt a few years later, Jews in Israel had had enough. The Jewish revolt that erupted in 66 CE was an apocalyptic revolt driven mostly by Jewish resentment against Roman occupation and oppression. Some Christian groups initially viewed the uprising as the fulfillment of prophecies about the end times and the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. But after a drawn out devastating conflict, the revolt ended in a catastrophic defeat for the Jews in 70 CE. After a month long siege, the new emperor, Vespasian, sacked Jerusalem. There was complete devastation, and the Second Temple, the spiritual and national heart of Judaism, was destroyed. The historian Josephus wrote that over a million Jews lost their lives, and 70,000 were taken back to Rome as slaves and were forced to build the Roman Colosseum. For both Jews and Christians, the failure of the revolt was a shattering, traumatic event that forced a radical thinking of messianic beliefs and expectations about the so-called kingdom of God that was supposed to come around soon. The refugee Jewish Christians fleeing Jerusalem had to grapple with how such devastation could happen if Jesus was truly the promised Messiah. In the decades after 70 CE, the canonical gospel accounts of Jesus, the ones attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, began taking written form out of the ashes of the Jewish revolt. Each gospel reflected a particular perspective and interpretation of Jesus' significance as the authors tried to make sense of recent events for Christian communities increasingly separated from their Jewish roots. Constantine's codification. Fast forward to the early 4th century and there was a new emperor of Rome, Constantine. Civil wars plagued the East and West as generals fought over who would become the sole ruler of the empire. In the West, Constantine had a rival named Maxentius, who wanted Rome for himself. The night before their armies were supposed to meet in battle, Constantine reportedly had a vision where he saw a Christian called Kiro and the phrase in this sign conquer. Kiro originates from the first two letters of the Greek word that means hatred of the letter P. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means Christos. The next day, when the armies met at the Milvian Bridge on the outskirts of Rome, Maxentius lost his balance, fell into the river, and drowned. It's hard to swim in full body armor. Have you ever tried that? Constantine won the battle before it even started, and in his mind, had Jesus to thank for becoming sole ruler of the West. So in 313, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan along with Licinius, the emperor of the East. It granted official toleration to Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. This legalized Christian worship and meetings and allowed the return of confiscated Christian property. Before this, there had been different regional edicts that sporadically tolerated Christianity, but the Edict of Milan was empire-wide. Christianity became another of the dozens of tolerated religious cults throughout the empire. The Donatist Schism So, after years of persecution, Christianity became a legal religion in the Roman Empire and everyone lived happily ever after, right? Right? Legality brought new challenges. The once persecuted church now had to deal with internal divisions and doctrinal disputes. One early controversy was the Donatist schism in North Africa over whether to accept back clergy who had renounced their faith under threat of death while Christianity was illegal. The Donatists elected their own bishop. 
Donatus, refusing to accept the Bishop Sicilian recognized by Rome. They appealed directly to Constantine to judge their case, an unprecedented move that began imperial entanglement in church matters. Constantine arranged councils to hear their appeal, but the Donatists lost and were branded heretics each time. Outraged, they remained a major rival church in North Africa for centuries. The Arian Controversy and the Fall of Rome As the Donatist crisis raged, an even bigger controversy erupted in Alexandria from a priest named Arius. He preached that God the Son was subordinate and inferior to God the Father, an idea that contradicted the doctrine of the co-equal trinity. This Arian view threatened to split the Eastern churches and alarmed Constantine, who wanted religious unity in his empire. Constantine dispatched a trusted representative to Alexandria to resolve the Arian dispute, but he only inflamed the situation further by suppressing the Arians. At Constantine's urging, he then called a grand ecumenical council to finally settle the controversy once and for all the famous Council of Nicaea in 325 CE. The Council of Nicaea would be the first attempt at an empire-wide council to get some consensus on core Christian doctrines and beliefs. Over 300 representatives came from across Constantine's realm to debate and rule on the issues, particularly on the whole Trinity issue. As the Arian controversy raged, the question of the Trinity, that God is three co-equal persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in one, substance I guess you could call it, took center stage. This mind-bending, paradoxical formulation had spurred dispute since the religion's earliest days. The council would have to define and decree official orthodoxy on the issue. The council was basically an arguing match and backroom intrigue between the two main camps, the Arians led by Arius himself and the Anti-Asians led by a deacon named Athanasius of Alexandria. Most bishops hoped for some kind of moderate compromise between the two. Athanasius took the bold move of inserting the term homoousian, meaning of the same substance, to describe Christ's relationship to God the Father. This was a controversial term that made a lot of bishops uneasy. Arius and his followers vehemently rejected it as heresy, calling Christ and God the same thing. Athanasius knew Arius would never accept homoousian, which allowed him to appear more reasonable. He was an agitator. While publicly debating compromises using terms like of similar substance instead of same substance, Athanasius worked behind the scenes politically to assemble a majority coalition for the homoousian view. By threatening damnation, most delegates ultimately signed the Nicene Creed, which validated the whole Trinity idea that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were one and the same. Arius and Arianism was declared heretical. But you know what? The Arian doctrine didn't die out. The Arian bishop Eusebius, an advisor to the Emperor Constantine, worked to rehabilitate Arian ideas and get the exiled Arius welcomed back to the empire. When Constantine's son, Constantius II, became emperor, he actually supported the Arian faction. This allowed Arianism to spread outside the borders of the Roman Empire. Eusebius ordained a Gothic missionary named Ulphilus, who successfully converted a whole bunch of Gothic tribes to Arian Christianity. The spread of Arian Christianity among the Gothic people really played a role in preventing their full assimilation into the Roman Empire and its Trinitarian Orthodoxy. The Goths remained a distinct religious and cultural group outside imperial borders, and they were threatening the empire. In the late 4th century, the Arian Goths came into conflict with the Trinitarian Roman Empire. In 410 CE, a Gothic army led by a guy named Alaric sacked the city of Rome itself. Rome's ultimate downfall, while not entirely because of Christianity, was in a lot of ways still caused by these warring factions within Christianity. Thanks for watching the insane origins of Christianity on Nutty History. If you love this kind of biblical historical content, like and share the video with someone who would too. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and ring that bell to keep up to date with all the videos about the nutty side of human history.